Welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain, and with me is my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. James Abraham from the Cleveland Clinic to discuss some key abstracts in hormone receptor positive space from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2024. Dr. Abraham, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Rahul and Rohit, for uh, including me in this conversation. I appreciate your effort to educate the community on the new developments from San Antonio Breast Cancer. James, thanks so much for joining us today and very much appreciate the kind words. Let's dive into hormone receptor space from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, we are hoping to cover four important studies. Two from early stage, which will be Europa and an update from Telorex. And then two from metastatic space, Padma and Ember 3. Okay, let's start off with our first study, Europa trial. This study looked at endocrine therapy versus radiation therapy in early stage breast cancer. Could you please walk us through the study design and how these results are impacting your practice today? The Europa trial is an interesting study because this is something we face in our clinic on a day-to-day basis. It's a phase three trial of about 926 patients, patients who are older than 70 who underwent a breast conservation surgery with or without central node biopsy, small tumors, T1, N0, ERPR more than 10%, and with a low KI67, and less than 20%. So they are asking the question of radiation treatment by itself versus endocrine treatment by itself in adjuvant setting. And the primary endpoint is an ipsilateral breast cancer recurrence and quality of life. And of course, they looked at the secondary endpoints, local regional recurrence, breast cancer specific survival rate, et cetera. So in the interim analysis, what they found was that radiation therapy offers better quality of life than endocrine treatment, and then lower incidence of treatment-related AEs in the RT arm. And at this point, there's no safety signal, there's no safety concern. As you brought up, this is a common thing that we run into in this particular patient population, but the primary endpoint of looking at ipsilateral recurrence. Often when we're talking about endocrine therapy, we're also talking about decreased risk of contralateral. We're talking about decreased risk of distance disease here as well. Based on this study, James, is this going to change your practice or are you waiting on long-term data? I think we should wait for long-term data to apply this broadly. But and when I talk to this particular patient who has a joint pain and I'm sure she already has tried this, then I can say if you want to choose one versus the other, RT is fairly safe. And then because of what we just talked about, if you want to omit endocrine treatment, it's not completely unreasonable. But of course, it's a risk benefit, individualized, shared decision making. Absolutely. It was so exciting to see that this SABCS, we saw quite a few studies trying to focus on de escalation and ensuring that less is perhaps more. And this was one of the studies. Okay, right. while we're talk- talking about early breast cancer, this is a good segue to our next study, Tillerex study. Tillerex has been practice changing since its initial publication back in 2018, where a majority of patients with early node negative disease and recurrent score of less than 25 did not benefit from additional chemotherapy. This has now been the standard of care for these patients. But patients with higher recurrent score or options here in adjuvant settings is often TC times four or anthracycline based treatment. We've always wondered in clinical settings, who's the right patient for anthracyclines because we have to be mindful of the side effects that come along with us. James, with all this in mind, thoughts on the recent updates from this study and its findings. Thank you, Rahul. So I'm someone who did a lot of clinical trials and grew up in the NSABP culture. (laughs) where and, uh, anthracyclines are not the most favorite you know, uh, <laughs> agents. We try to de-escalate anthracyclines if not appropriate. I think this is a really good study. So and, uh, especially node-negative patients, 
we try to avoid anthracyclines unless really indicated. So this particular study actually looked at subset of patients, Taylorex, who had a recurrent score of more than 31 or less than 31, who received an anthracycline-containing regimen versus a non-anthracycline-containing regimen. So what they found was in patients with recurrent score more than 31, there is an improvement in distant recurrence-free survival. Now, so recurrent score more than 31, an improvement in recurrence-free survival when they received anthracyclines. And, and they saw that in patients who are under the age of 50 or no, older than 50, premenopausal or postmenopausal, and most of the benefits were in tumor, which was more than two centimeters. And higher the recurrent score, the benefit was higher. So that is really interesting too. The key question is, are we going to use this tomorrow in our clinic? And then let's just think, if I have a patient who's um, 52, she has a three centimeter tumor and it's grade three and it's not negative, I'm planning to give chemo, then should I use this tool to make a decision? I think I'll have a conversation with this patient about TC versus an, an anthracycline-containing regimen, or TC times six versus AC followed by T or TAC regimen. If the patient says, I want everything to be done, I need to know the risk and benefit, I, I, I probably listen to the patient advocate. He said something like, more information is helpful. And that's what she said, more data, more information is helpful. I may use in those subset of patients. If the patient says, give me more data so that I can make the right choice, then I may use it. But if he ask me if I'm going to use for every patient, probably not. This is certainly very intriguing, especially this question comes about when we are treating premenopausal who are node positive, but have low oncotype score, where the struggle is, is... OFS plus AI beneficial or rather chemotherapy itself is beneficial. Now, in your practice for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, whose current scenario gets anthracycline in adjuvant settings? What I use is more than four nodes based upon the tic tac data. We know that that's a subset of patients who benefit. You know, So more than four nodes, I'll say you should get anthracycline. But let's just say if the patient is younger, you know, let's just say we have a, a, a 32-year-old with three nodes. I'll say you know, for that patient, the long-term risk is relapse from breast cancer rather than you know, a cardiomyopathy. You know? So then I'll say uh, you should consider anthracycline-containing regimen. But overall, more than four nodes, I'll say you should get anthracycline. Thanks for clarifying that. Now, moving along into our next study, which is PADMA study, looking at the current role of CDK46 inhibitor plus endocrine therapy. Is it the right approach, rather, which is the standard of care? But again, when compared to chemotherapy in aggressive disease, is it an appropriate approach? We have seen similar data with right choice, which did establish that, yes, CDK46 inhibitor plus AI is the right approach. James, what was the study designed for PADMA and what did it show? Right. This is an interesting study. It's, as you said, it's adding to the existing knowledge and strengthening our, our conviction that endocrine treatment with CDK46 is the right treatment, even in first-line metastatic with, and if I can say, high risk. So the, the, so the study design is it's about 150 patients randomized between endocrine treatment plus halbociclib. And the control arm is chemotherapy of physician's choice. These are hormone receptor positive patients, HER2 negative, indication for mono chemotherapy, no prior treatment in the metastatic disease, no asymptomatic bone only or oligometastatic. We are, these are not like low risk patients. The un, and so the patient should not have uncontrolled and, or untreated CNS and life expectancy more than. Uh, six months. So let's just say if I'm seeing a 42-year-old 
with multiple levelations, asymptomatic, LFTs are normal. And a lot of time I get this phone call from the you know, second opinion or offering doctor say, hey, she's young and she has multiple lesions in the liver. I feel like I should be giving chemo. But I say, look at the biopsy. The EAPR is strongly positive, HER2 negative. I always say, let's try endocrine treatment, of course, now with CDK46, the right choice. And then this PATMA data reinforces our strong belief that's the right thing to do. The primary endpoint was time to treatment failure. The secondary endpoint is progression-free survival and overall survival. And they had, and a majority of the patients were postmenopausal. And the really interesting finding is or nearly 50%, you know, nearly 50% had liver mass. The median time to treatment failure is 17 months in the palbo endocrine arm and six months in the control arm. Progression-free survival is 18 months versus nine months. So that's a pretty significant difference between these two arms. Yeah, again, CDK46 inhibitors with endocrine therapy is still our standard of care. This is practice reinforcing study. In all comers, be it someone with visceral disease, heavy tumor burden, CDK46 inhibitors with endocrine therapy should still be our go-to. All right, lastly, let's talk about Ember 3. James, can you walk us through this study design and findings of Ember 3? This study got a lot of buzz. It is uh, published in uh, New England Journal at the same time. Uh, Immunostrand, it's an oral selective estrogen receptor degrader. Uh, so it's one of the third generation. It has CNS penetration. So this trial looked at uh, this Immunostrand, monotherapy, and combined with abomaciclib for patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, metastatic breast cancer. Uh, they are pre-treated with endocrine treatment. It's a, uh, a phase three trial. So it's a fairly large study. It had three arm, immunostrand, 400 milligram a single agent, then standard of care end endocrine treatment with falvestrin or exemestin as the second arm. The third arm is, that's the one which you know, they analyzed that's the uh, immunostrand, 400 milligram daily, plus bamusecle. And the primary endpoint is the PFS, and second endpoint is overall survival and PFS. Significant improvement in progression-free survival versus standard of care endocrine treatment in patients with ESR1 mutation. The hazard ratio is 0.62, uh, but it did not reach is uh, a statistical significance in overall population. So single agent immunostrand is highly active, improvement in progression-free survival in, you know, in patients with ESR1 mutation. And all subset of patients benefited. Uh, and then you know, overall survival analysis are uh, immature and it's ongoing. The safety profile is fairly well tolerated, no new safety signal. The second conclusion is immunostrand plus a barmacycle. So significantly improved progression for survival versus immunostrand as a single agent uh, in all patients, not just ESR1 mutated, all patients, the hazard ratio of 0.57. That's a pretty impressive hazard ratio. And, and that doesn't matter if it's ESR1 mutator. And then the PFS is about 9.4 months. And all such patients are benefited. So, so the conclusion is immunostrand strength and, uh, as a single agent in ESR1 mutated patients or combined with abomaciclib in all you know, patients is a potential treatment options after progression on endocrine treatment in patients are positive, are HER2 negative, and advanced breast cancer. We do have oral CERD available by itself, which is l but we don't have that data as a combination. So we await for all these combination trials. Right, right, right. The other thing I want to bring up is the control arm. We know that these patients on the current standard of care endocrine therapy don't do well. And that's the reason for us to look for these strategies of combination 
But Jane, most of our patients today are exposed to abemocyclib either in first line in metastatic space or in adjuvant settings based on Monarchy study. If this was to become available, where do you see yourself using this combination? So I know the metastatic ER positive space is really, I don't know what's the right term. When I, all patients have more options, let's just say. Absolutely. That, yes. Yes. And, and uh, so I think I think that's probably the right way of approaching. So um, let's just say, I know Hal Bernstein put like a fairly complicated chart on <laughs> that. So and, uh, when you see a patient you know, who has an ESR1 mutation, so now we have an option. If, if it's available, yes. It's yep, in yep, the yep. guidelines. Yep. We have an op option of using this versus the last trend. Indeed, the space of oral surge is getting crowded as we already have a single agent approved in the setting, which is Elicestrant, as you mentioned, Rahul. And many more of these combinations are being studied, uh, as you alluded to, James. We'll see how it all pans out and, importantly, how this changes our current landscape and future. Well, James, thank you so much for taking the time to cover some of the key studies from Hormone Receptor Positive Breast Cancer Space from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2024. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In today's discussion, we had a chance to focus on four key studies from Hormone Receptor Positive Breast Cancer Disease from San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2024. This included Europa study, where we are seeing that radiation was better tolerated over five years of endocrine therapy. We need long-term data to select the right patients in which we can let go of endocrine therapy and radiation therapy would be rather good enough. Then we touched on Taylor X study, which reported benefit with anthracycline-based chemotherapy in patients with recurrent score of 31 and above. We also had a chance to touch on Padma study, which continues to reinforce our current practice of endocrine therapy with CDK4-6 inhibitors over chemotherapy in all comers, including visceral disease in first-line settings. Then before closing, we talked about Amber 3 and the data on oral surds in combination with epamacyclib that looks promising in all comers, regardless of ESR1 mutation. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to check out our other conference highlights from ASH 2024 and SAPCS 2024. We are the Oncology Brothers.